That's our nose. Just ask her. Glass girl. All righty. It's good to see everyone out this morning. I realize there's a lot of folks aren't here today. Uh, we had a, quite a few phone calls this morning about folks that were sick and family members that were sick and, uh, and uh, people that were going to come today but said they had flu and everything. So, you know, this is one of those days that where uh, usually there's a lot more people here, but the rain, I think, may have kept some folks away, but you're here today. Now, here's the thing. What we're going to do is we're going to do something very, very simple today. What we're going to do is, is that we're going to actually look at the scriptures. We're going to look at what the scripture says about certain subjects today and let the scriptures, let God's word, let God's word define things or decide things. Now, for those who have not been in my class before, what you have to understand is that in Bible class this morning is the time that you can raise your hand and you can ask me a question. And then I can actually try to answer the question based on whatever we're, the subject we're talking about. In the worship service today, is going to be a monologue. I'll be speaking and I won't give you the opportunity to be able to talk back to talk or ask a question. But my whole goal is, is that for the Bible study is the time that we use that we can try to fulfill the command that we can be of the same mind of the same judgment and speak the same things. People that profess to be Christians should not be saying so many different things. In other words, if you ask me, for example, what I must do to be saved, and I say I'm a Christian, and you ask someone else who says that they're a Christian what they must do to be saved, if they're saying something different than what I'm saying, and then another person saying something different, that's not good. That's not a good thing, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus made it very, very plain also that for those who believe in him, if you continue in his word, John 8, verse number 31, if you continue in his word, then are you his disciple. In other words, if you don't follow what he's saying, he's not your master, and you're not his disciple. He said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciple indeed, or for sure you're my disciple, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall do what? Make you free. He said, we be Abraham. See, we've never been in bondage to any man. That was a lie, number one. That's why Jesus just barely told him early in that same chapter, you'll be a father of the devil. He's a liar and the father of it. Okay? And so they said, we, we, we've never been in bondage to any man. Jesus said, anyone who commits sin is the servant of sin. Jesus started being free from sin. Okay? So if you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ, you cannot know the truth. Because Jesus said, if you continue my word, then are you my disciple? And you will know the truth. And what's amazing, many people are trying to profess to be free from sin, not knowing what Jesus said you must do to be free from sin. Now, how can that be? Everybody's working on how they feel. Everybody's working on what their preacher, their pastor, their pope, their grandmother, their grandfather, whoever it is that they hold in high esteem religiously, that's what they're rolling with instead of actually listening to what Jesus said. You see, Jesus said the truth is what is able to make you free. And in John chapter 17, he said to, for those that his, for the disciples that Jesus was praying for, he said, he prayed to the Father, he said, sanctify them, make them holy, set them apart from everybody else, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Jesus said that God's word is truth. God's word is not opinion. God's word does not change whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're black, white, sky blue, yellow, it does, male or female, it does not change. It's always true. There's a lot of truths in the world that do change based on gender. You know, I don't care what you say. If I'm a man, I could never have a baby. <laughs> That's a true statement. I can say I can never have a baby. And I can I can say uh, I can say uh, uh, Alvin can never have a baby. But see, that's not a truth for everybody in this room. There's people in this room that can have babies. But see, when it comes down to this truth concerning God's word, concerning us for spirituality and everything, God's word is the standard on everything else. Matter of fact, let me just back that up one more time. God's word is the standard on who can have babies and who can't. <laughs> so let's just make sure we understand that too. So, <laughs> so my point I'm trying to make is that we want to actually just try to go to God's word and see what God's word says about some things. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is one of those days where... Statements get made, if you go back and if you look on the internet on certain things, statements get made that really never consider what God has actually said, okay? For example, you know, people want to say that, that Easter is the resurrection day of Jesus Christ, okay? And then when I went and looked again, I was also looking at people that know that I don't celebrate Easter say, well, it sent me happy Passover, Brother Hal. <laughs> not knowing that Easter and Passover is not the same thing. You see, what you have to understand is, is that, you know, and then here's another one that I got. 
You know, if you, if you query this on your, you query it on your phone whenever you get a chance, not right now, but just don't do it because you need to make sure that this information is your information, that you don't, that you don't base everything you believe based on what Brother Hal said. My whole goal is not to get you to hear what Brother Hal has to say. I want you to hear what God has to say. OK, never leave her saying Brother Hal said, OK, if Brother Hal said it and Brother Hal said something that is not true from the scriptures, call me on it. Call me to the table on it. I want to know the truth. My, my ego is not so big that I cannot be corrected. OK, but here's the point. What you have to understand is, is that when I'm looking at it, here's what I qu queried on the Internet when it came down to Passover. The question came up was, is Passover and Easter the same thing? So here's what, what the majority statements actually said. It says, no, that Passover was the, was, the, was the remembrance of Israel being brought out of Egyptian bondage. But Easter is remembrance of Christians of the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. I'm like, no, wait a minute. That seems like a very interesting answer. Because what the whole point of this whole the article, and there's more than one article that said this. The whole point of the article was is that the Passover was something to commemorate the, the, the Israel being delivered from Egyptian bondage. And it, and, and, and it really has nothing to do with Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm like, <gasps> now wait a minute. Now, if that's the truth, then the Bible should back that up, right? Also, here's another thing that's put out when the question is, when you query, what is Easter on the Internet right now? The first 50 queries you're going to have to go through is going to say it's a celebration of the death. But it's a holy day for Christians. That's a high holy day for Christians as a celebration for the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter is. Now, if I said that in most surroundings, most people would actually say amen. The problem you run into is that if that is actually true, then Jesus would have said it or the Bible would have said it. Now, here's the first thing I need you to understand. The practices of Easter are not in the Bible. Just so you get this. Let me just show you what I'm talking about. I'm just going to, I'm going to, before I even get into explaining the past over here, I want you to just think about something very, very simple here. Okay. First thing I want you to think about is, is that, okay. So who here is actually that Easter is the resurrection day of Jesus Christ? We all. Who here is actually hunted the Easter eggs and had the peeps? And all the other stuff, right? The bunny rabbits and everything, right? We all of us. So all of us. Nobody's nobody's excluded here, right? Because we know that's all what we all got told, right? Now here's my question to you: What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ and Easter eggs and bunny rabbits have to do with each other? <laughs> but we all did it, yes. not even knowing what it had to do with relationship. We all did it. The bunny rabbits and Easter eggs are not inside the Bible. But the problem is, we all did it because we know that's what we got told. Now, what happens is, is when people in the know get called to the table on it, they will say, well, I know that it had pagan beginnings. Like, I was never told that as a kid. It was told to me like it was doctrinal gospel truth. We know we all got told that. Right? And so what I'm going to have to understand is, see, that's one thing. And then the other part is what that bothered me, right? The part that bothered me was is that why does it happen on a different date every year? See, here's the point I want you to help you understand something here. You see, there's something wrong with this way of thinking. Because what you have to understand is Passover, we're going to see, falls on a date, not a day. But Easter falls on a day. It's always on a Sunday. OK, and so what I find very interesting is, is that there's a problem with that. Just show you what I'm talking about. I will use my mother as an example. My mother is probably one of the most influential people on me in my in my entire life. Definitely one of the most influential people in my entire life, because I know when I was not acting, right, my mother's always the one that, was, that held things down to remind me of the Lord, to remember the Lord. Right. And see, I never I never considered myself, thought of myself to ever be a preacher or anything like that. Other people saw things differently that I did not see. Right. But here's the point. My mother was born on August 14, 1939, and she died on October 2nd, 2021, okay? The day she was born on August 14, 1939, that was a Monday. The day she died was October 2nd, 2021, that was a Saturday. Both of, and this year, in 2024, 
both her birthday and her the day she died is on the same day. It's on a Wednesday. Now, what is my point? My point I'm trying to make here, when I commemorate my mother's birth or my mother's death, I don't commemorate my mother's death on a, on a, on a, on a Saturday every time, every single year. It's a date. And I don't commemorate my mother's birth on a day, on a Monday. It's a date. Now, here's the point. Why do we say that the resurrection day of Jesus Christ is on Easter when it's not a date? It's a day. Don't you understand the problem with that? Doesn't that seem kind of weird? Like, how did we even come up with, does anybody here, no, not anybody has been in my Bible class, can anybody here explain to me how Easter is decided and who decided it? You see, it happens, you realize it happens in March sometime, sometime it happens in April, it can happen 25 days apart from each other. That makes no sense. Let's just be honest, it doesn't make any sense, does it? But we do it year after year after year after year. So here's the first part of my class today is going to be explained to you the Passover. Okay? The Passover from the scripture. What it meant to them and then how it ties into the New Testament or ties into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the scriptures. Can we do that? And that way you'll know what it is that when it comes down to the death. I can tell you from the scriptures, you're going to know today the date that Jesus died. Right? Okay? And then you're going to be able to figure out the day he was resurrected based on what Jesus said. How about that? So, can we do that? So here's what we're going to do. I need everybody, if you would, turn in the book to the, in the Bible to the book of Exodus. We're going to be doing a whole lot of reading. Now, the reason we're going to do a whole lot of reading is because you need to understand the story. Because once you know the story, then nobody can play the game on you anymore. Okay? Don't learn just the verses. Learn the story. Because when you know the story, you can tell somebody the story in your, own, in your own words and still be saying what God said. But if you just use a verse, just a verse, and nobody knows what, the, what story the verse is in, who said it, who they said it to, and why they said it, you really don't know what that verse is about. Okay? So, let me lead us up to, to this point to where we're going to start reading. And what's going to have to happen, and for the next 10 minutes, I'm, what's going to happen, I'm going to read to you the story about the Exodus out of Egypt. We're going to read 51 verses. Now, it's important that we do this here. Brother Hal, you know that's going to take a long time. I'm going to lead us up to this point just to help us understand what's happening here. So what's happening is the children of Israel are in Egyptian bondage. They've been in bondage for 430 years. Now, here's the question, Reuben. I'm going to ask you a very simple question. If they had been in bondage for 430 years, if they could have got themselves out of it by themselves, would they have been there 430 years? No. Which shows you they didn't have the ability to get themselves out. And so what had to happen was finally, here it is that God is actually hearing his people now. And what he's going to do is he's going to make it possible for them to get out of Egyptian bondage. And he's going to give them directions on how to get out of Egyptian bondage, right? But what he had to do, he had to, the problem that he had is that his people had been there for so many generations that he had to show his people the difference between who he is and who the gods of the Egyptians are. Because when you get inside of a society and you're there long enough, you start thinking the way they think. Doing the, some of the same things that they're doing. And so what he had to do is that they had, to, they had all of these different gods in Egypt. And what we have to understand, for those who saw the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments kind of showed a few. Now, the Ten Commandments movie, it didn't do the, the scriptures any justice at all. But you remember all the different plagues that actually happened? And what we need to understand is that when God sent those plagues, those were not random plagues. What God was doing in the, in the face of his people and in the face of Pharaoh, what he was showing his people was that the gods of Egypt were not real gods, that there's only one true God here, and that's me. And you need to understand this. So what, what he did is he challenged all the gods of Egypt. Now, you need to go back and read it, but I'm going to tell you what actually happened up until this point. And so what he did, first of all, he did in Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, he changed the water of the river Nile into blood. Now, you have to go back and see that. Now, also, we're videoing this, so you can go back and watch this again. He changed the river Nile into blood. Why did he do that? You recognize that the Egyptians felt that the Nile was a seat of all life and that life came from the river Nile. And so the Nile was considered by the Egyptians a god. And so when he turned the Nile into the river into blood, he was challenging the God of the Nile River in front of his people and in front of Egypt. Where is your God? 
In other words, I'm turning everything to blood and all the fish are going to die. Now what are you going to do? Right? And then what he did in uh, Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 through 15, he, re- he let frogs come up out of the, of the Nile River and run over the whole countryside. Now what you need to understand is if you go back and look at your Egyptology, the frog was a sacred animal. It was a federal offense to kill a frog or step on a frog. But see, what happened was the frogs came up out of the Nile River so abundantly that they covered the ground. The Bible actually said there were so many that they were, they were in the bed, they were in people's ovens, they were, on the, they were everywhere where you could not walk without stepping on the frog. Imagine how many frogs that must have been to where everywhere you walk, big fat frogs and little bitty frogs, everywhere you walk, you're popping and stepping on frogs. <laughs> what he's saying is, where is your God? And are you going to call justice due? After the frogs had died and after Moses, after Pharaoh pleaded with Moses to remove the frogs, he prayed and the frogs died off and they piled, they swept the frogs up and there were heaps of frogs everywhere and the whole place stank. Where is your God? And then what we see, the people and the animals were infested with lice. Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 through 19. And just so you have to understand, that didn't happen to everybody. The only way that got lice were the Egyptians and Israel didn't get nothing. Where's your God? Okay. And then there's flies that swarmed that covered the whole land. But not God's people. Only the Egyptians. They had no flies upon Israel. And then we also see, and Israel were in Goshen, by the way, just so you understand that. And then also we see that the disease killed the livestock in Egypt. In Exodus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. But the livestock of the Israelites did not die. Only the Egyptians. And then there are boils and sores that affected the Egyptians and their animals. So the boils that were from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet to where they couldn't even walk without being in pain. But only to the Egyptians. Where is your God of health? And then we also see that hail destroyed the crops and vegetation. Exodus chapter 9, verses number 13 through uh, 35. Where's your God of the, of, the veg, of, the, of the fields that protect your fields? And then we saw swarms of locusts covered the land and ate everything that God had, had been beaten down that was left over from the, from the hail. And then we see in uh, Exodus chapter 10, verses 29 through, uh, 21 through th- uh, 29, we see that a darkness covered Egypt, Egypt. A darkness so dark, Stefan, that you could feel it. It said it was so thick that it could be felt. But the only ones that were in darkness... Were the Egyptians? God's people were not in the Israelites were not in darkness. And then we see uh, in Exodus chapter eleven, beginning verse number one, we see that God is finally actually telling uh, Moses, "You got to prepare yourself because this one is going to be a doozy." And after all of those things. And after all of those times, even when Pharaoh said, I will let you go, and he changed his mind and changed his mind and went back on his word, God said, and I'm paraphrasing, this is going to be a big one. They're going to be begging you guys to leave after this one. (laughs) But you have to be prepared here. Because what's happening is, is that, let's look at chapter 11 really quickly, just so we can see this. Okay? Exodus chapter 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, verse 1, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt, after he will let you go hence. When he shall, when he shall let you go, ye shall surely trust, uh, thrust, he shall surely thrust you out uh, hence uh, altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people. Let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her, of her neighbor jewels of silver and of, of, of jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the favor of the, gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man of Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of the Egypt, and all the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like, none shall be like any more. But against any of the children of Israel, shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between Egyptians and Israel and all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me saying get thee out and all the people that follow thee and after that I will go out 
And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, and my wonders may be uh, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. Now, what is the point? Here it is. There's going to be something big happening. What you need to understand that every, every, when, uh, uh, that particular night at midnight, the firstborn of every household, whether it be man or beast, whether you are royalty or whether you're just a regular person, the firstborn is going to die. Unless you follow these directions. And he's going to give his people some very important directions because now this is the this is the point. This is the point where they're about to be delivered now. Now I want us to pay close attention to the instructions that, that Moses and Aaron give to the children of Israel because he's going to explain the Passover. Are you sure, Brother Al? We're going to get once you sum it up, you're going to see he's going to say, This is the Lord's Passover. But you need to understand what it is. Pay attention to the dates here. Now, beginning of verse 1, chapter 12. And the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye to all the congregation of, the, of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take every uh, take of them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating make, uh, shall make you your account of the lamb. The lamb shall be without blemish, a male lamb in his first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening time. And you shall take of the blood and strike it on the two posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw or sodden, or at, at all with water or roast with fire, his head from his, uh, uh, with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until morning. And that which remaineth until morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it, with your loins gird, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now let's make sure we caught what we got happened so far. So what you have to happen here is something so big. Now keep in mind, Israel has been in bondage for 430 years, and God has given them the game plan of how they're going to get out of bondage tonight. Now let's make sure we understand. Did that make any sense how they're going to get out by doing that? But did the directions make sense? So what he said, he said, this is going to be a, this is going to be a new, this is going to be the first month of the year. In other words, something so big happened that they changed their calendar. It shall be your first month. Now, next, in the next chapter, you're going to see that month is called Abib. It wasn't until after Egyptian, uh, uh, they were in Babylonian captivity that the, that the name Nisan came along. But really, the month was just numbered as 1 through 12. That's all it was. So the first month. So on the first month, he said on the 10th day of the month, right? You remember that? I want each one of you take a male lamb in his first year. Make sense? And then I want you to separate away from the sheep and from the goats. Okay? And on the 14th day of that month, I want you to kill it in the evening time. Now, let me show you how simple this is. The reason that they're doing this is because they're about to be out of Egyptian bondage. It didn't make sense how them taking a male lamb is going to actually deliver them and how taking it on the 10th day and separating the way and on the 14th day killing it in the evening time, how that's going to make any sense or how they're going to be delivered at all. But the instructions make sense though, right? Even if you don't understand how this is going to work. Right. Now here's the point. You realize, now I'm going to use, I'm going to use you for example, your, your, your lady. See, here's the thing. How many children do you have? So Reuben is your firstborn, right? So do you realize that if you wanted to get out of Egypt alive that night, you had to follow these instructions perfectly, right? And so if Jesus, if, if the Bible actually says that you need to take on the 10th day, I want you to take a lamb, a male lamb, you know? Now, what if somebody came to you and said, well, isn't a girl lamb just as good as a boy lamb? No. <laughs> Do you even want to hear that? No. 
You know, you know, you're going to follow the instructions exactly, right? Because you realize if you do not follow the instructions exactly, little Ruben's toast. You're not going to argue about whether a girl lamb is just as good as a boy lamb, right? If God says a male lamb in his youth, what are you going to look for? What if Reuben says, hey, you know what? They got some little girl lambs on sale today. Can We, we should get that. Are you even going to let him get away with that? You're going to be looking. Matter of fact, you're going to be peeking over his shoulder to make sure you don't mess this up, right? <laughs> you see my point? It was important that the instructions got fo followed because when you understand that, yes, after this actually happened, every firstborn, no male firstborn in every household of man and of beast died that night. Except for those who follow these instructions. You take it on the 14th, he says a male lamb in his youth. A young male lamb. And that male lamb must be without spot and without blemish. In other words, you, you're not gonna you're not gonna let him get away with like, hey, you know, it's a male lamb, uh, but you're like, no, something chewing on his ear, his ears have chewed off. <laughs> not that one. No, not that one. He's limping. Yeah, but Ruben's like, he's he's a thrifty guy like me, but these are half price. No. No. But I'm I'm using it as an example. You wouldn't do that though, Ruben, because you know the instructions, right? The male lamb in his youth, without spot and without blemish. And see, one I have to understand, I know that people at that time had some of the same problem we have. We want to question whether or not the details are important. If you wanted to be delivered, you had to follow the details perfectly. And he said, that what you're going to do is you're going to take it and you're going to kill it in the evening time. You got to kill it at the right time. Okay. And then what you had to do is you had to eat it inside the house. And in case your house was too small, in other words, if you didn't have enough people in your house to eat it all, you got three people. We can't eat a whole lamb in one night. What you do is you get with another one of your neighbors that has maybe three people and y'all would get together so that that whole land can be eaten and nothing can be left over in the morning time. And you had to eat it roast with fire. You can't eat it raw. So you can't say like, you know, Samir's like, you know, I prefer my lamb chops medium rare. No. <laughs> can't eat it raw. You know, I don't really like anything charred because, you know, it kind of has that burnt taste. I don't mind boiled. You can't have it sodden, not boiled. You can't make stew with it. You can do it, but you ain't getting out of Egypt. <laughs> now, I'm making light of this, but I want us to see, see here very plainly what he's saying here. And then what you're going to do, that, that, and he said in verse 6, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evening time. Everybody kills it at the same time. Okay? And then you're going to take the blood, and you're going to put that blood over the doorpost. On the side and over the doorpost. And the Lord said, I'll be coming through Egypt that night. And when I pass through there, when I see the blood on the doorpost, then the destroyer will not come in and destroy the firstborn of your household. So we understand that this is what the Passover is. Okay? And he told Israel this. Now we're going to keep reading just so we get to the point. We're going to get down to verse number 51. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to sum all this up for you. He said, don't leave anything until the morning. Uh, verse number 10. And he says, you'll eat it with your shoes on your feet, your, 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 your loins girded, and your staff in your hand. It's the Lord's Passover. Now, here's what he's saying. He's saying, you're going to eat this, and when you do this, have your traveling clothes on because you're leaving. Now, I know that would be confusing to me. Now, wait a minute. Where's the part about you, us killing the Egyptians and fighting and leaving? Like, no, he said, you do exactly like what I told you, and you eat this with your traveling clothes on. Now, let's just be honest, Sister Dolores. If you only had those instructions, does that even make any sense how you're going to get out of Egypt that night? No, not at all. It doesn't make any But the instructions make sense, though, right? Here's one admonition I want to give everybody. Anytime God tells you to do something and he tells you what it's for, put your traveling clothes on and do it. Because even if you don't understand why and how it's going to work, once you understand, if you understand the instructions, how about this way? How about doing it the same way whenever my dad used to tell me something when I was a kid? Dad, why? Because I said so. I don't have time to explain to you things you don't totally understand. You understand what I said, don't you? If God said it, it's just settled in your mind. See, a lot of times we always want to have the little bumper stickers on the back of our car that says, you know, God says it, I believe it, that settles it. You're saying too much. If God says it, it's settled whether you believe it or not. 
You just need to decide that God told you the truth. So have your clothes on. Be ready to go. Now, verse number 12. He said, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. And I will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the, I am the Lord. Why do you think he, ex he said he's going to execute judgment against the gods of Egypt? Who do you think he was trying to execute judgment on the gods of Egypt for? For the Egyptians or for Israel? For Israel. Because he had to get these gods of Israel, Egypt out of their minds. He needed to make sure they understand who truly is God and what God you should be paying homage to. Okay? Let's keep going. Verse number 13. And the blood shall be for you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it as a feast to the Lord, uh, uh, to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it, a, uh, keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. And whatsoever, uh, and whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat that only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in the selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generation by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at evening. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth, whosoever eateth that which is, uh, is leaven, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. You shall eat nothing leaven, and all your habitations shall you eat, uh, shall you eat unleavened bread. So on the 14th day of the month, you're going to actually take and you're going to kill that lamb. That is the Lord's Passover. Uh, once the sun goes down on that day, from the time you eat that unleavened bread on the Passover, for seven days after that, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we're going to see this in Leviticus, on the 15th day of the month, is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. It shall be a Sabbath day unto you. No work shall be done. And you shall have no leaven in your house for seven days. And on the 21st day of the month, seven day again, another Sabbath day. And it's a date. Notice he didn't say day of the week. He said the 14th day. We're going to see the 15th day and the 21st day. There were holy convocations. It is a Sabbath day, a day of rest. Sabbath does not mean Saturday. Sabbath means day of rest. Now, Israel had a Sabbath day, a day of rest, every seventh day. But what you have to understand is that the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread had nothing to do with the day of the week. It had to do with the date on the calendar. You understand what I'm talking about now? So the 15th day was the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and there'll be no servile work to be done except what you need to do to eat. On the seventh day, you couldn't even cook. No. There was a difference, okay? The same thing on the, 17th, the, the, the 21st day of the month. And so what we need to understand is that is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay? Those are their traveling days. That's when they're leaving, okay? Now let's get back to the text here, and I'm going to bring all this together. <coughs> uh, 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take your lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that, that is in the basin and strike the lintel on the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sealed the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer to the destroyer to come in into your house to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and, thy, to, and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the Lord, the Lord will give you according as he hath promised that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children say unto you, what mean ye by this service? That you may say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, 
who passeth over the houses of the children of, of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed their heads, uh, head, the head and worship. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. They did exactly what Moses and Aaron told them to do. Now, verse 29. And it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the born of the land of Egypt with the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne upon the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. There was a great cry in Egypt. For there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and your children, and go. Serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds and be gone. And bless me also. In other words, pray for me too on your way out. So Moses is saying here. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we, may, we be all dead men. And the people took their, their dough, uh, uh, dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they, bowed, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them the, them which things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Now, you know what the word spoiled means? That means they looted the whole place. You know what just happened here? Because you don't understand that Moses actually stood in front of Pharaoh, told him what was going to happen. And he says, by this time, by this time, uh, when, this, when this night actually happens, you're going to be begging us to leave. <laughs> Y'all realize that the children of Israel were delivered out of Egyptian bondage and they looted Israel, Egypt, took all the wealth with them without ever lifting one sword. And how did they do it? Lamb without spot and without blemish. Right? They followed the directions. Okay? Now let's keep going. Verse 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sutcloth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. So 600,000 were just men. That's not including the women and children. Over a million when you actually look at everybody, okay? And a mighty multitude went up also with them, with flocks and herds, even very much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought forth out of Egypt. So it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt. They could not tarry, uh, neither had they prepared themselves any victuals or any, any food. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. That's why I told you, they were there 430 years. They were there for a long time. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even uh, self-same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is the night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house it shall be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth out of the, uh, of the flesh uh, abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. In other words, you got to eat it, remember? Roast it. But you can't break it. You cannot break a bone in his body, okay? Okay? Uh, he goes on and says, All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall, shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover of the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. And then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one, of the, one born in the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Now the circumcision was showing that you were in covenant with God, okay? He said, one law shall be to him that is homebound, homeborn, and unto a stranger that sojourn among it. So in other words, if you had a stranger, you had a proselyte, you had anybody that came in and want to observe the Passover, they had to be circumcised. Because one law, everybody obeys the same law. There is no differentiation if you're going to observe the Passover. Okay? And said, thus did all the children of Israel, and the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass. The self same day that the Lord did bring the children of, uh, of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. 
Now, let's, let's, let me just get down to the, the month really quickly. Keep going. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn whatsoever, whosoever open the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of, for, for by strength of the hand of the Lord brought you out from the, this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month of Abib. All right, so here's the question. The Passover. What was the month? Abib, right? What were they supposed to do on the 10th day? Take a male lamb, right? A male lamb within his first year. A, a young lamb without blemish, right? And so on the 14th day, what are you supposed to do? Kill it with. In the evening time. And you're supposed to eat it. How do you cook it? Roast it. Roast it. Can you boil it? No. Can you make stew? No. Can you chop it up and make ground? Ground? No. no. You had to eat the whole thing. Okay. You had to eat it with your clothes on, your traveling clothes on, with your staff in your hand, your shoes on your feet, ready to go. In other words, they did it believing that they were going to be leaving bondage that day. That shows you believed. Okay. Now, see, my point is that when you understand that the date is very, very clear. Okay? The purpose of it was very, very clear. Now, when you understand, what does that really mean to us? What that means to us is, is that this is the things that are in the foretime are written for our learning. And once you have to understand it, that these were actual types that we can actually see. Uh, these are actually anti-types that we can actually see. Or types that we can actually see, the actual anti-type, the actual article, what God was pointing to. In other words, Moses was a type of deliverer. Because he delivered God's word. Matter of fact, God told Moses, I'm going to make you as a God in the sight of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And what you have to understand is, is that he, Moses delivered his people out of bondage into the promised land. Well, to, pointed him to the promised land. He didn't get a chance to go himself. My point is he's the deliverer. Okay? So we understand that he's a type. While the children of Israel were in bondage, they were in bondage. And they were living sinfully in bondage because they were worshiping other gods. Now, we covered that on this past Wednesday, just so you can understand that. Because what you have to understand is when they got out of the, into, into the wilderness, one of the things that actually happened was is when Moses went to go meet with God up on the mountain, the people made a, a god out of golden calf. Where do you think they learned that from? That's bull. That's not, that's not, that's bull. That's not like baloney bull. That's actually the god bull from Egypt. <laughs> it's an Egyptian god. You see my point? So what we have to understand is, and God allowed his people to roam around the wilderness for 40 years when he could have taken them to the promised land in about a month. Why do you think he let them roam around for 40 years? He said to try them, to see if they're going to obey my voice or not, or no. He had no trouble getting them out of Egypt. You know what he had trouble with? Getting Egypt out of them. Now, let's make our parallel. So Moses is a type of deliverer. Satan, or Pharaoh was a type of Satan. And bondage was a type of punishment. And we're going to see this in a minute. So after the children of Israel came out of Egyptian bondage, they're out in the, in the, in the, in the wilderness. They come up on the Red Sea. Pharaoh changed his mind again, didn't he? You see, their bondage was a type of sinfulness, right? And so here it is. Pharaoh sent his armies after them. Moses opened up, listened to God, raised his hands, the sea parted. They walked across on dry ground, made it through to the other side. The water was standing up in a, in a liquid form, but standing up as a solid on both sides of it. They had a cloud that was above them. They passed through the Red Sea on dry land. And then when the Pharaoh's army pursued them, what happened was the water came back in on them and washed them away. Now, that's important that we catch that. So what we're going to do is we're going to tie a few things together here just so you get this. Okay? What we need to understand is, is that when I have time, and I'll do this in a future reference, you need to understand that when you think about how the scriptures define who Jesus actually is, and when you understand the timelines that went along with Jesus, then you understand what I'm talking about here. Let me get my highlights here so I can actually show us this really quickly. Now, when we saw that it shall be a, 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 a shall be a, the first of the year unto you, it shall be uh, you should take a male lamb. And on the 10th day, you should take that male lamb, one for each house, is what we actually saw there. And so when we understand that, that when you go back and you look at the timeline of when Jesus actually lived, you have to understand how the Bible describes him, okay? As a matter of fact, in John chapter 1, 
and in verse number 28, it says, and this is when G John the Baptist saw Jesus says, and the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You saw that, right? Let's look at also what we see in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And then he, when Peter is actually reminding the, 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 the Christians at that time how it is that they were delivered from their sin. He actually says in verse, he says in verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 1. He said, for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corrupt things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by the traditions of your father. In other words, when you were in bondage of sin, nobody could have paid money or gold or silver to buy you back. But here's how you actually save from your, your sinfulness. He said, but, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Oh, wait a minute. Where did we hear that? Where did we hear that? From the Passover instructions, that male lamb, right? Without blemish and without spot. Jesus was in his youth when this all happened. He was not an old man. He was in his youth when this happened. He was the male. And what Peter says, you are not redeemed from your vain conversation received by your father by silver and gold, but by a lamb without spot and without blemish who was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Before you and I ever got here, God had already decided how he's going to deliver us from our sin. Amen. You think that's going to change? If God decided it before time began, do you think it changed now? No. You see, you're starting to see that comparison now, right? But by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish or without spot, who was barely foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. You see, there's a difference between foreknowing and foreordaining. You see, I got a knee and I got a shoulder that anytime the weather's going to change, my knee and my shoulder hurt. I can foreknow the weather's going to change, but I can't foreordain it to change. Foreordained is being God had decided how it was going to happen. It was going to happen exactly like that. He foreordained, he made it happen exactly the way he said it was going to happen. Foreordained. We also see that she keep it till the fourteenth day and kill it in the evening time. In Luke chapter twenty-two, here it is. Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he says, "With desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer." Y'all realize that in that at that at when the, the 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 sun goes down, the the the, the, the evening the, the 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 day starts. And so he ate it early. He, he wanted to eat the Passover, but he had to be that Passover, that sacrificial lamb himself. So he couldn't eat the Passover and be the Passover at the same time. But it all happened on the same day. And I'll show us that a little bit, a little bit later. So it's the Passover that he was actually trying to observe and to remind them of some things. Now, here's the point I want to make sure we catch here. How Jesus is tied into all of these things. Number one of the things, you got to kill it in the evening time. you got to eat it, roast it right, and you got to eat all of it. Don't leave nothing until, until the next day, and you do not break a bone in his body, right? Now, here's what John had to say in John, in John chapter 19, again, concerning Jesus. Here it is that Jesus was actually uh, uh, being, uh, on the cross, being crucified. And what we have to understand is, is that when we look at, in the book of John, and John's account of this, you're going to see something very interesting here. Now, let's pick up at John chapter 19, verse number 30. And we got to move fast here because the Bible's going to be over in here five minutes. So here's the point. Jesus is on the cross, right? He's dying on the cross. He's going to hang his head and he's going to say it's finished. I'll talk about the things that led up to that in, in, at another date, but I need us to catch something here. And it says, verse number 30 says, and when Jesus therefore had, perceived, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not be remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was a high day. Now, make sure we understand that he said that Sabbath was a high day. I'm going to, if you give me the chance sometime, I'm going to show us that what we call Palm Sunday is something that somebody kind of made up. Okay, so here's the point. On the 10th day of the first of the first month, of the first of Abib, or the month of Nisan, Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And they were laying palms at his feet, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. I mean, Hail, uh, Hosanna in the highest, what they're saying. Hosanna in the highest, right? But by the 14th day of that same month, he was carrying his cross up Golgotha. And on the same day, on the same hour, when that, 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 that Passover lamb was being sacrificed, Jesus was dying on the cross. 
The same day, the same hour. He is that our Passover. He is that lamb without spot and without blemish. That's what they were pointing to when they were doing this, uh, coming out of Egypt. And notice what actually happened here. They said that they had they wanted to hasten the death because he's on the cross and they had to hasten his death because the next day was a Sabbath, was a high holy day. What was the next day after the Passover? The first day of the feast of unleavened bread. It is a high holy day. There's, you shall do no servile work. Remember that from Exodus chapter 12? They had to hasten the death because the next day was the first day of the feast of unleavened bread and they can't handle no dead bodies and stuff like that on a Sabbath day. Now Lot says, verse 31 again, the Jews therefore because it was the preparation that the body should not be remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that the legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers, then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him or with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came out blood and water. And he saw that, and he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that he might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Where did that come from? The Passover lamb. Amen. You see, what we have to understand is when I ask the question, why was it that the legs of Jesus was not broken? They wanted to hasten the death so that they could get those bodies off that cross before the high holy day or the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Why did not not break Jesus' legs? Because many people say, like, no, because he's dead already. No, you missed the point. The reason he did not break his legs is so that he can fulfill the scripture. Fulfill the prophecy that a bone shall not be broken in his body. You know why did not break his leg? Because God foreordained his legs would not be broken. Come on now. You see that? They couldn't have broke his legs if they wanted to. Because <laughs> God foreordained it. And again, another scripture saith. They shall look upon him whom they pierced. That's Zechariah chapter 12, verse number 10. Yeah. Now, see, here's the point I want to make here. For those that try to tell us that the Passover and Jesus and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ are not related, somebody's lying. Right. You see, the Passover lamb was a type. Something that pointed toward the Messiah. Right. Scriptures that he fulfilled. Yeah. And what we have to understand, it happens on a date. So I'm going to give you a very quick class. Okay. Remember when Jesus actually said that he says, he says that, that uh, to this generation, that he had a generation that was trying to get a sign. He said, no, no sign should be given to this adulterous generation except for that of the sign of Jonah. And Jesus said, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said that. Three days and three nights. Right? Now, here's the point. Y'all do realize that Jesus died on the Passover, right? What day did the Passover happen on? What's the date of the Passover? The 14th day of what? Of our being, right? What day did the Passover happen on happen on every year after that? He said for your, throughout your generation it's gonna happen. 14th day of our be, right? You realize that Jesus died on the Passover. Now, if he died on the Passover, which means the 14th day of Abib or the 14th day of Nisan, whichever way you want to count it, you can go look at the Jewish calendar today. 14th day of Nisan, you need to understand that the Passover is not even happening yet. The Passover is like Passover is like next week, just so you understand that. So my point is it's not today, okay? So here's the thing. If Jesus died on the 14th day of Abib or the 14th day of Nisan, and he said he's going to raise again three days and three nights later, what day did, he, day did he rise on? Think about it for a second. If you know he died on the 14th, all you got to do is count three days. You follow me? See, the scriptures tell us. But here's the point. Where do we get Easter from? Oh, <laughs> See, what you have to understand is that just like, just like the turning point for Egypt, for Israel, 
their deliverance out of Egyptian bondage is what God referred to. Every time he's trying to remind them of who they are, remind them of his power, and remind them of their deliverance, he pointed them back to their deliverance out of Egyptian bondage. That was the cornerstone of their whole faith in God. What is the cornerstone of our faith in God? The death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The only way we deliver from our sins is by that lamb that was foreordained by God. He's our Passover. So that when our temple, our, when our dwelling place, this habitat that I live in, this, this tabernacle that I live in, when it's covered by the blood of, of Christ, when the destroyer comes through, he'll pass over me because I'm covered. My dwelling place is covered by the blood of Christ. You understand what I'm talking about now? What I'm telling you, somebody's lying. Amen. <laughs> Let me tell you the story really quickly how Easter's decided. Easter's decided is the first Sunday after the full moon, after the spring equinox. Decided 625 AD by the first council of Nicaea. Over 300 years after Jesus left the scene. So here's the question. On what date did it become acceptable? To observe something foreign to God's word. You see, we're going to get into the real problem with it. Because the foundation of our faith, according to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said, Brethren, I deliver unto you the gospel, that what I preached unto you, that which you also receive, wherein ye stand. If you keep in he said, by which you're also saved, if you keep in memory that which I delivered unto you, unless you believed in vain or for nothing. For I delivered unto you, first of all, the most important thing I delivered unto you is how that Christ died for our sins, just like the scriptures foretold, according to the scriptures. Was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Just like the scriptures foretold, Christ died exactly like that. What scripture are we talking about? We're talking about the whole Exodus story foretelling about Jesus. We're talking about the psalmist actually explaining how he would die. We're talking about Isaiah talking about how he would be beaten beyond recognition. We're talking about all of these things and Christ died for our sins just like that. that we, the gospel is the how that Christ died for our sins. That is the turning point. That is the cornerstone of our faith. That is the one thing we remind us of every single Sunday and we remind us of every single day. Not the first Sunday after the full moon, after the spring equinox. Every day you should remember that. And you, as a memorial, you remember it every time we gather ourselves together. And no foreigner can be part of this. Only a person that is in covenant with God and in covenant with Jesus Christ can actually have this meal. You see, don't let nobody get you into believing that the Passover and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ has no relation. They are tied together. And neither one of them has anything to do with Easter. Any questions? Any comments? Appreciate your attention to the lesson. Let's all pray together. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings that you've given us, especially for your son and his precious gospel. And Father, we pray that we'll always have minds that are ready to, ears that are ready to hear your words, eyes that are ready to see, minds that are ready to understand, and hearts that are ready to receive this word. Knowing this word, when taken in, is able to save our souls, Father. And so, Father, we ask your blessings on each one that is here, that we'll have a heart that's ready to receive your word, but also a mouth that's ready to speak this truth to a lost and dying world. And, Father, we know that you're faithful, and we pray that we can be seen as faithful in your sight. And we ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all go to the restroom, get ourselves something to drink, and come on back in.